Good to see all of you and welcome here to the Mets today. It's great to be together and uh, great that you made it in. I know that the weather yesterday was a little uh, fearful, um, but I think the roads were okay and it's wonderful that uh, we've been able to gather this morning. Uh, Over the Christmas season, we spent time in Luke's gospel, thinking about the Christmas story. And as we embark on the new year, I want actually to linger for a few weeks in Luke's gospel to do something that's been on my heart and my mind to do for some time. And I've been sort of waiting for the opportunity, and I think this is it, and that is to address one of the most important and complex relationships in our lives, and that is our own relationship with money. It's a huge discipleship topic for us. It's vitally important that we think biblically about it. And Jesus, as it turns out, has a lot to say about it, an awful lot to say about it, not least in Luke's gospel, where Luke is at pains to capture some of the key things that Jesus teaches us on this important theme. So we're going to spend a few weeks lingering in Luke to think about the theme of money and faithfulness within that sphere of our lives. And to begin, I'd like to turn today to Luke chapter 12, and I'd be grateful if you would turn there with me, Luke chapter 12, and I'd like to read for us from verse 13 to verse 21. Luke chapter 12 and verse 13. This is page 871 if you want to use a church Bible, which we'd be so glad for you to do. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care, and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night... Your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray together as we begin. God, our Father, we thank you that you are so gracious in speaking to us and recording your words for us in the Scripture and bringing them to us in power through the work of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will do that today, that you will inform our minds and impact our hearts, shape our will in such a way that we will desire to be more and more the people you have called us to be. And we pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, money is, of course, not a bad thing. The Bible never says it is. But it can be a very dangerous thing. And here in Luke 12, Jesus highlights for us the danger of covetousness, the danger of greed, the danger of wanting the money that other people have, the danger of wanting more and more and more. Jesus is teaching a crowd, as he often is in his ministry. He has been giving various warnings within this particular section, warning people to live in light of the final day, the great day of judgment. On that future day, verse 2, hidden things are going to be revealed. The judged will be cast into hell, verse 5. And those who have acknowledged the Lord Jesus Christ before men will be acknowledged before the Father and the angels, verse 9. Now, a question comes from the crowd that gives Jesus the opportunity to warn us of the dangers of covetousness, of greed, in light of that great and coming day. The question, or really the request, comes in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
Now, Jesus has no interest in getting into the middle of some family spat or conflict. It's an awkward one, and it's going to be messy. Verse 14, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? Which, of course, is a very ironic question coming from the one who is judge of all the earth. But he, Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't want to go there. Instead, the request opens up a wider issue that Jesus does want to address with the crowds. Verse 14, take care. Be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Take care. Warning. Be cautious. Guard yourself against all covetousness, against all greed, and the word could be translated either way. What is the covetousness or the greed that Jesus has in mind here? It is the desire, isn't it, for more and more in material terms. More money, more possessions, more goods, more land, more houses, more things, more wealth. It is the desire for the possessions that the other person has, whether it be your brother, uh, your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, the person on TV, the media star, the legendary entrepreneur on the news, whoever it is, it is the desire to acquire more and more things and assets and possessions. It is covetousness. It is greed. And, of course, we all know the feeling. We all know the desire. It's all too familiar to our sinful hearts. We know about it. Some among us will have had precisely the family spat, actually, that this man is having at the present time. I want my share of the family pie, and I'm going to get it. And Jesus says, take care. Be on your guard. Watch out. And to guard this man and to guard the crowd and to guard all of us here today, to guard us against covetous, against covetousness, against greed, Jesus teaches us in these verses a key principle, and then he illustrates that principle with a parable. So that's, that's where we're going today, the principle and then the parable. And then at the end, I want to think together about some of the key practicalities that flow from these two things, the principle, the parable, the practicalities. Okay, that's where we're going first, the principle. Notice it again there in verse 15. Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, that is against all greed, for because here is the reason why one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's the principle. Your life, my life, does not consist is not made up of the quantity of our possessions, the amount of stuff we own. Now, let's just think about that for a minute. Let's just take that in. What, what does the world have to say about all this? What is the secular view? Is it not that a person's net worth, and notice the language, their calculated value, that's the language that's used, a person's net worth is the value of all that they own minus the debts that they owe. And the world around us absolutely says that life consists of this abundance. Life consists of the amount of what we have and what we own. That is the message of the world. We hear it all the time, loud and clear. And what does Jesus have to say to the world? And what does he have to say to our hearts? He says... No. He says the calculation is wrong, the math is off, the calculus is incorrect. Whatever the world might say and whatever you and I might think, the measure is in fact fatally flawed. The world will, will always measure the value of people, the value of a life, by the possessions acquired or inherited at birth. But Jesus says, you're looking at the wrong measure. It's like, it's like taking a thermometer, okay, and trying to measure the length of a piece or, of wood or string by the thermometer. It's like taking a measuring tape and trying to calculate the mass of something. It, it's not the right tool. It's not the right system. You are looking at things in entirely the wrong way. And as Jesus says that to us, as he highlights the issue, we have to admit that he's right, we, we have to admit that he is putting his finger on something that is a real issue for us 
and for the culture around us. As Jesus articulates the principle, it actually strikes a chord in our hearts because we know we are quick to measure our lives and the lives of others according to that measure, the abundance of possessions. You know, we, we drive by great homes in fine neighborhoods. We, we see someone dressed in expensive designer clothes. We observe a friend living a very lavish lifestyle and making big purchases. And we notice it and we, we register it. And on some level, that person kind of goes up in our estimation. Oh, right. Our, our unspoken value calculation is adjusted and their net worth is increased in our eyes. Or, or, or conversely, we see another person driving you know, a rusty old car and living in a modest home and wearing worn out clothes and we make certain judgments and we draw certain conclusions about them. And, and then we look at ourselves and either we see material success and prosperity and are tempted to think well of ourselves because of it and to feel satisfied with ourselves because of it, or we see a lack of those things and a lack of the resources we crave and we start to think badly of ourselves because of it. But in either case, whichever way it goes, we are believing the lie that life consists in the abundance of our possessions or the lack thereof. And Jesus says, you are wrong. You've got it wrong and you are thinking wrongly. Life does not consist of the abundance of our possessions. And now to drive home the principle, Jesus has for us a parable, a story with a spiritual meaning to illustrate the truth. Verse 16, there's a rich man whose land holdings are doing really well for him. They are producing plentiful crops. It's an enviable situation. Not all land is fruitful. Not all assets are productive, of course, but this land is good, and the farm is really producing, and the man has grown rich because of it, but prosperity has produced for him a problem as well. Verse 17, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. The, the barns are not big enough to store all the crops the land is now producing. The vault in the basement isn't big enough for all the gold. The seven-car garage with the car elevators isn't big enough for the collection of Ferraris. The boathouse isn't big enough for all the speedboats. The home isn't big enough for all the artwork and all the antiques. I cannot store all my riches. What is a rich man to do? How to deal with such a situation? Such a challenge, such a burden, the answer soon comes. He's a clever boy, after all. He didn't get that rich by being stupid. And the, the answer that comes to him is this, verse 18, I'm, I'm, I'll do this. I'll, I'll tear down my barns. I'm going to big, build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. That's the obvious thing. That's what I've got to do. Make more space for all the wealth, the resources. Create a safe space to store it all up, to keep it, to guard it. His grain, his goods, his equipment, his belongings, the store of his wealth. He wants to keep it all real close and he wants to keep it real safe. And so he builds the capacity. It's the obvious thing to do. And as he looks forward to doing that and as he uh, contemplates how it's going to feel, the sense of security, it's going to give him, verse 19, he says this, I will say to my soul, Soul, clever soul, well done you. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Well done. <laughs> Relax, eat, drink, be merry. You're all set. You've done so well. I mean, you're, you're really set, my soul. You know, you're not just rich. That was good. But you're really rich. And, and more than that, you found a way to hold on to all the wealth. You are set for the long run now. You have got it made. You are secure in your wealth. Now just kick back, enjoy life, eat, drink, be merry. You have nothing to worry about. And, and so this rich man, he's made an accounting of his life. He believes that life consists of the abundance of his possessions. He is an illustration, of course, of that conviction and now that he has increased his abundance from being just rich to being very rich, his stock has gone up in his own mind. He's feeling good about himself. His life looks just fantastic to him. 
He is preaching a message of joy and contentment to his own soul. And the world around him, of course, would affirm him 100% in this. All looks great, but for this. But for this one thing. But for this awkward and unwelcome intervention from heaven above. Verse 20, but. But. But God said to him, fool. Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared for yourself, whose will they be? See, God has a message for this man who so busily tore down his barns to build bigger barns, who focused his energy on storing up wealth, who found security for his soul in the abundance of his possessions. God has one word for him, fool, you fool. It's a strong word, isn't it? It's a strong word, and it's spoken from heaven with a strong reason. This night, your soul is required of you. Well, that's an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? It's the language of of lending and then returning, of borrowing and then giving back. It's the concept that's captured actually so beautifully in George Matheson's hymn, which is sometimes sung at the funeral of believers. Maybe you know it. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in the ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. See, that's the believer's true and accurate understanding. Our life is out on loan from heaven above. And that's the Lord's message to this foolish man. Your soul has been out on loan from its maker. Your life has been borrowed, and now the Lord, he is calling it back. He is summoning you actually to the judgment, and you will now leave this earth and all your goods within it behind. But you see, the rich man, he, he hadn't been thinking of that day. In fact, he hadn't actually been thinking about the Lord at all. His wealth, we're told, came from the fact that his land, notice it there in verse 16, had produced a plentiful crop. You see, the Lord, who is the creator and the sustainer of the earth, had given this man his wealth through the land. It's not that the rich man had been clever, although he probably was clever. The Lord had been gracious. But but the rich man, he'd only thought of himself. He'd only spoken to himself. He made no reference to the Lord at all in any of this. Jesus emphasizes that fact in the way in which he tells us the story. The man thought to himself, verse 17, what shall I do? For I have nowhere. I will do this. I will say to my soul. I mean, it's I, 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 I. But then God interrupts the internal dialogue of the fool And he tells him that his life is now being suddenly recalled. I remember once from this pulpit, I made the simple point that you never see a, you know, a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You know, the dead don't take their things with them to the grave. Well, of course, having said that, that same afternoon, a friend from the congregation who will remain nameless emailed me a picture of a hearse, you know, pulling a (laughs) U-Haul. So I, I, I learned that day that I need to do my research properly before I say stuff. Um, But the point still stands, doesn't it? We can't take it it with us. We never will. Fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? What's going to happen to all the stuff? Those barns full of grain and of goods. Uh, What help will they be to you? When your borrowed life is recalled by your maker and you stand before the judgment throne, what's the point of the accumulation? I mean, really, what good has it done? The parable is pretty sobering. The calling out of the fool from heaven above is startling. And the parallels with us and our outlook on life, they are unsettling, aren't they? One of our pastors here asked me the other day uh, a question that I thought was very good and very, very perceptive. He he said to me, what in your view, Jonathan, what in your view is the idol of heart that would keep our church family back from generosity to the work of the gospel? What is the thing that would hold us back here? You know, in our city, in our context, in our culture, what is it? What is the barrier? What is the issue? What is the idol? I think that's a great question. Isn't that a good question to ask? And the answer to it will, of course, vary from place to place. 
and from time to time. In some contexts, in some communities, you know, the idol might be extravagance and luxury. We just want more stuff. Uh, in other places, it might be experiences. We want to do more things. We want to go more places. We want to taste more of what the Lord has to uh, offer, what the world has to offer uh, in the Lord's creation. In, in other places, it might be our, our homes. You know, we just want to make them into magazine-worthy palaces, and that's our idol, and that's where every penny goes into the home. Now, here in our city, I don't know what you think about this, but I think the answer is this. You may agree or disagree, but here I think it is. It's security. I think that's our idol. Mostly, not exclusively, but mostly the idol is security and stability. We're a government city uh, folk or methodical planners here, great planners. People gravitate to this community because it's stable and jobs are steady and the economy is predictable. It is safe. It's secure. We're an affluent city. Incomes are high here. Uh, household incomes are some of the very highest in the country, and therefore, because we're a wealthy country, some of the highest in the world. But here's the thing. We're not hugely extravagant spenders. We're generally savers. We want to know that every day of our lives is actuarially, financially accounted for in our planning. We want to be certain that we will never face a day of want. That is the dream here in our community. And, and I think of that, and I think of the question that came to me, and then I look at the text that I've been studying this week, and I think to myself, the rich man grew up in Ottawa. <laughs> this guy was a local he must have been. Of course, he wasn't, by the way. If you want to talk about that afterwards in the history and the geography, we can. But he could have been, given his attitude of heart. You see, he is so familiar to us. With that in view, just, just look at it again. Just listen to it and think about our context. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. The farmland around here in the Ottawa Valley is really good, by the way, really fertile. He thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. You see, that man is living the dream as far as our community is concerned. He's not spending it all. That's the interesting thing. No, no. He is storing it all. He's cautious. He's careful, just like the people of our city. He is stashing it all away so that he knows he will be safe. You see, he believes that life consists of the abundance of his possessions. He feels that his soul will be secure if he has lots of wealth socked away, and he has managed it. He has achieved it. He's done it. He has arrived. He's living the dream. Now, friends, is that not our culture? Is that not our context, our environment? Is that not our default way of thinking? Is that not the idol of so many of our hearts, material security and safety for many years? And so what do we do? We attempt to accumulate, and some will be more effective at it than others, but certainly that is the drive and that is the desire of so many. But if that's what's driving us, and if that is the great thing that we long for, if that's how we measure our lives, by the abundance of our possession, if we're just storing up wealth, Jesus has a warning for us. Here's the warning. God will require our lives of us. It will all come to an end. And as we stand before him at the judgment and give an account of our lives, our accumulated wealth, well, it will be worth precisely nothing to us. And so Jesus says, and he leaves us with this, verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. It's foolishness. It's folly. It's of no value. 
if all we are doing is laying up treasure for ourselves and we are not rich toward God. Jesus is urging us to ensure that we are instead being rich toward God in the way in which we live. The alternative to storing up the wealth, to being covetous of what we do not yet have, the alternative is instead to be rich toward God. That's what the parable is calling us to do. It is to invest ourselves in something else, to prize something else, to live for something else, and that something else is God himself. Be rich toward God. But what does that mean in practicality? I mean, it sounds good. It, it sounds right. It sounds appropriate. We listen as believers and we think, yes, I want to be rich toward God. But what is the outworking of all this? What are we to do? Well, we've got the principle, we've heard the parable, and now we need to turn to the practicalities, the practicalities. Let me suggest four fairly brief lines of practical application from all of this. Four practical ways to ensure that we are rich toward God. Here's the first one. First, remember the Lord's judgment. Remember the Lord's judgment. You see, this whole section rings with reminders of the fact that God will judge the people of this world, and we ourselves will have to give an account to him of how we've lived. We've seen it here in the first three sections of chapter 12, as I mentioned. Right before this uh, parable, Jesus has emphasized the importance of being willing to own his name before others, because if we will own Jesus before others in this life, he will acknowledge us before the angels of God, and we will know ultimate forgiveness. The judgment is in view there. But having heard that, Having been told of the ultimate importance of publicly naming the name of Christ before others, this man in the crowd, he ignores all that Jesus has just been saying, right? He's, he's not interested in that. And he turns immediately to what's really on his heart, the issue of his inheritance, the money that he wants from his brother. See, he's not interested in the judgment. He's not interested in living for Jesus and acknowledging Jesus before others. He just wants his money. He's storing up treasure rather than being rich toward God. And, and the contrast there, it's very striking. The challenge is right at the surface there. We don't have to look for it. Do I, do I care more about ensuring that I belong to Jesus Christ and am ready for the judgment because I've sought refuge in him, or do I instead care more about ensuring that lots of money belongs to me in the here and now in this world? Now, if I've got the judgment in view all the time, my main concern is how I relate to Jesus. My central concern is that I am honoring Jesus, that I belong to Jesus, that I will be in good standing with Jesus even before the angels of God and on the final day. Now, now the rich man in the parable, he wasn't giving any thought to that final day when he would ma uh, meet his maker. He was satisfied in his soul with the abundance of his possessions, but the day it came upon him suddenly, he was totally unprepared. Spurgeon once asked, does the world satisfy thee? If so, then thou hast thy reward and thy portion in this life. He goes on, make much of it, for you shall know no other joy. Now, that's the truth. That's a stark reality. If we are satisfied in the things of this world, if we have forgotten the judgment, then no joy awaits us beyond the grave. Friends, if you and I made a point of remembering each day that we will give an account before God, that we will stand before his throne, that we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, if we remembered that each day, really remembered it, we would live differently, wouldn't we? We would invest differently. And I tell you one thing we would not do. We would not spend our energy and our time hoarding wealth that cannot last and that will be of no value on the final day. If you are poor in this world, but you know and love Jesus Christ, if your trust is in him and his salvation, if that's you, then you have riches toward God that the wealthiest unbeliever does not possess. He or she may own houses and lands and stocks and shares, wealth that you could barely count and never use. And you, by contrast, may have more or less nothing to your name, but when it comes to the judgment, his riches will be worthless and yours will be of inestimable value. His will mean nothing and yours will mean everything. I wonder if you believe that. And I wonder if I do too. I wonder if you and I live as though that were true. 
Remember the Lord's judgment. Next, be content with the Lord's provision. Be content. The man in the crowd was unhappy with the fact that his brother had inherited more than him, it seems. Maybe his brother was the older brother and the bulk of the estate or all of the estate had gone to him. And Jesus called that out as covetousness, greed. That's where the discussion started. That's the root of the issue, wanting more and more. And the rich man, he wanted more and more and more. He couldn't store all his wealth to keep any... He just had to figure out how to do that because he wasn't going to let any of it go. But it, it did him no good. Laying up treasure on earth won't do us good in the long run. It's, it's worthless. And the alternative to covetousness is contentment. And the Bible calls us again and again and again in different ways and at different times to learn contentment. It's a big theme of Scripture. I love the prayer of Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. Maybe you know it. It's so good. It's worth fixing in your mind. It's actually worth memorizing. Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. The writer asks this of the Lord. It's actually a petition to the Lord. He says, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Isn't that an interesting prayer? Isn't that a wise prayer from the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom? See, you and I, what would we be inclined to pray for? If we were really being honest about it, what would we like to pray for? Riches. But the writer, inspired by the Spirit of God, he is wise enough to know that riches bring danger, even the danger of denying the Lord out of a sense of self-sufficiency, saying to our soul like the rich full that we are full and secure in our riches, but the way of wisdom, what is it, is to pray for sufficient provision and in that then to be content. The same truth is underlined and developed in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 where the writer says this, Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Why? I mean, why? I mean, people aren't content. People love money. Why should we be different? Because the Lord has promised to his people that he will never leave us. Now, that's being rich toward God, isn't it? That's trusting in him. That's delighting in him. That's finding our security and our satisfaction and are all in all in him. Now, I, I, I know that money is tight for many at the present time. Finances are a struggle in this season. Interest rates are high. The economy is not as good as it was. I, 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 I'm aware of that. But even so, even as we might need to be praying for provision and waiting on the Lord for provision, as he promises to provide, let me ask you, do you know contentment? In material terms, do you know contentment? Are you content with such things as you have? with what the Lord has given to you? And, and, and if not, then the follow-up question, is there a place in your heart where covetousness has taken hold, where greed has taken root, where you long for things that you do not have, where you want more and more and more and more? Is there some heart work that you need to do, that I need to do before the Lord, some things you need to think through, pray through, repent of, address? Be content with the Lord's provision next Share with the Lord's people. Think of that rich man in the parable. His income, it just kept coming in. It kept coming. The land was prosperous. The farm was successful. Fantastic. That in itself wasn't a problem. That's a great thing. But the problem came with his response to blessing and abundance. The problem came with his desire to keep more, to sort of stock up the wealth, to hoard it. That was the problem. He was laying up treasure for himself. Well, what was the alternative to that? What was he to do? Well, put simply, wasn't it to give some of it away, to give a lot of it away, to give it away to address the needs of the family of God? I mean, that's so simple. That's not rocket science. That's obvious. You know, if you have abundant wealth and your brother or sister is in need, you, you, you do something about that. If you're a believer, you do something about that. You know, the Lord cares about the needs of his children and he expects that within his family there will be practical care. There has to be. If one has too much and another has too little, there is a solution right there. 
You know, Jesus will talk more about meeting the needs of others in Luke, and we're going to talk more about that as we go through, but it's so obvious, it's so important. Augustine commented on this rich man that, and I quote, he did not realize that the bellies of the poor are much safer storerooms than his barns. Isn't that good? In the end, the barns were not safe. He thought it was safe. It wasn't safe because the hoarded wealth of this man was a big problem at the judgment day. It became his liability. This remembering of the needs of others is something actually I see happening here in our fellowship in various ways, not least through our our benevolent work and our benevolent fund, where those who have extra can give and those who are in need can discreetly make an approach. And it's so good, it's so right, it's happening week by week all through the year. But what's happening in the heart and life of that greedy man? The storing up of an overabundance. That's so wrong. Share with the Lord's people. Remember the Lord's judgment. Be content with the Lord's provision. Share with the Lord's people. And finally, as as we close, invest in the Lord's work. See this rich man, he needed to put his money to good use. He needed to lay it at the Lord's feet to invest in the work of the kingdom, to get on board with God's agenda in the world. That's being rich toward God in this situation. That was the, that was the obvious thing to do, but his, his heart, it wasn't, it wasn't there. That, that wasn't even on the radar for him, no thought of it. Now, you and I, if we're gospel people, we know God's agenda in the world. We know what he's interested in doing. He wants the good news of his son, the gospel of his salvation, to go out to the very ends of the earth. He wants the great commission to be fulfilled. And we know the need is great. I mean, look out at our culture. Consider how lost people are without Christ. I mean, we see it all around us. We know. Consider how many have never heard, how many walk in darkness, how many in our community know nothing of Jesus and his salvation. I mean, the generation coming up know nothing. You say the name of Jesus, they won't know who he is. Our, our city here, the city of Ottawa, it's a, it is itself a mission field, the capital city of an increasingly pagan nation. Here in this building, we sit just across the river, really, a stone's throw away from the least reached region in the Americas. Did you know that? North, South, Central Caribbean, the least reached region, and that is, of course, the province of Quebec. 0.5% of the population know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we think of the billions of people in our world who are totally unreached, no access to the gospel. Of the 8 billion people living in the world today, an estimated 3.4 billion are part of an unreached people group, people who have little or no access to the gospel at all, as we were hearing about earlier. And, And you and I know, if we're converted, if we understand the gospel, we know that eternity is at stake in these things. The gospel, we know it's a matter of life and death. There's so much ministry to be done. There's no limits, no end of work that needs to be done to pursue God's agenda in the world, God's own mission. But here's the simple reality, and we might, we might like to pretend that this were not so, but it is the reality. All of this takes money. It takes money. God has li- called us to live and to serve in the real world where there is a real economy where it takes money to support gospel workers, money to buy equipment, money to produce books and resources, money to get the message out on media, money to do the work. And if God's money, which has been entrusted to his people, is being stored up in ever-increasing barns or stock brokerage accounts or pieces of real estate, or vaults, or Bitcoin, or whatever, if God's money is being hoarded rather than released, less work is going to get done. Fewer people are going to get reached. That's the simple reality. See, we could do do more gospel work with more gospel resources. Here at the Met, we've got a long list of dreams for gospel outreach. We have so much global missions work we want to do. So many open doors. We have so much potential to reach our city and impact our nation, to get the gospel out to unreached people groups all around the world. I personally have a growing sense that Lord is 
calling us as a church to step into new opportunities that we've never thought of, never embraced before. I, I think he has tremendous work for us to do for the kingdom in this season. We're sensing that actually together as a leadership. We're just starting to talk about that in some very fresh ways. We want to explore that with the whole church family over the coming months. You see, the Lord, he's not done with us here in the, in the capital city of this nation. I think actually the Lord is just getting started with us. But here's probably the main limiting factor, finances, resources. That's the bottom line. That's the simple truth. And, and that's why our attention to money is an important topic for our Christian discipleship. It's why Jesus calls his people very clearly to faithfulness in stewardship. It's why regular giving is a key Christian discipline. Now, many within our church family have learned that discipline and live that discipline. Many make joyful, generous, sacrificial, regular, proportionate gifts to the work of the gospel as a central part of the Christian life. Many have learned that and lived that out month by month and year by year. The first portion, whether it be a tenth or another proportion, there's no legalistic requirement of a fixed amount, but many follow the cue of the Old Testament and start with a tenth of income as a benchmark. But a number within our church family have learned that and lived that and make it a priority. It's why we're here, actually. It's why we're in this building. It's why the ministry happens. But I would say this. I'm very aware that many have not made this central to their Christian discipleship, and maybe that's you. I, I have no idea what any individual gives, but I do know our overall patterns as a church. And I'll tell you this, if our whole church family gave something like a tithe to the work of the gospel, we could do things for the kingdom we've never dreamed of before. But I also know we're quite a long way from that. That's the truth. But any, by any measure, any measurement, we're a, a little distance off that. For, for many, and this may be you, you're giving, if you're honest about it, and it's between you and the Lord, it's really just a token and little more. It's an afterthought. When all your other priorities and expenses are met, then we'll see what there is. But I'll tell you this, the Lord God of heaven and earth, he is not looking for a quick tip at the end of church. No. He's looking for the first fruits. He expects to be our first priority when it comes to our funds and not the afterthought. If our giving isn't our first priority in our budgeting, if it's not the first thing out the door on payday, then it's probably not going to happen. Or if it does, it's likely to be meager. I had time with our young adults on Thursday night in a question and answer session. One question I had was, uh, you know, what advice would I give to, to young men who are not yet married? And that was an interesting question. I thought about that. And I, I, I ended up saying one thing. I said, start the pattern of sacrificial giving now. Even if you feel you don't have much income and not much to give, start it now because it only gets harder. And if you don't learn at the beginning to set aside the first fruits for the Lord, as expenses go up in life and family life and kids and all the rest of it, it gets more and more expensive, not less so. You'll, you'll struggle to start later. Start now. Consider again the language Jesus uses in summarizing the lesson of the parable. In verse 21, he wants us to be rich toward God. That language is very practical when it comes to our money. We can't avoid that. It means getting really serious about our giving, serious in such a way that the rest of our financial life is actually shaped around the Lord and our giving to him. And you know, that might sound burdensome. Maybe it sounds burdensome, but you know what? It's actually a gift from the Lord to us that he calls us to do that. It's actually the Lord's kindness to us that he allows us to participate in his work in this way. I mean, God is God. He doesn't actually need anything from you, and he doesn't need anything from me. This isn't about God needing something from us. All that we have is his anyway, but he invites us to participate because he knows that it will be good for us. We will all of us tend toward idolizing things and idolizing wealth. We will tend toward the covetousness of which Jesus speaks here. We will all be tempted toward greed and having the opportunity to give toward the work of the gospel, being called upon and challenged by the word of God to do that, it is actually for our good. It's a gift to us. 
Before we ever think of the usefulness of our money for any gospel project, the first benefit is actually to us as the giver. Those who have been serious about giving, you already know that. It's a gift to us. And here's why regular giving, it is actually our first line of defense against the idolatry of money and the idolatry of wealth, against covetousness, against becoming the rich fool. Every week or month when the check is written, when the automatic withdrawal goes out, each time that happens, it's a little inoculation against idolizing money and things. It's a little shot in the arm. It's telling our heart that the Lord means more, that the gospel matters more, that the things of this earth are temporary and passing away, and the things of God are eternal and of true value, and we are helped and we are guarded personally as we give. Friend, let me ask you in all seriousness, are you rich toward God? Would your bank account confirm the truth of your answer? Only you know, the Lord knows. See, on one level, this is not complicated. If you're not serious about giving your money to the Lord and His work, and everyone's ability to give is different, this is going to look different for each of us, but if you're not serious about it in your situation, and you don't prioritize it, the answer, the answer to the question is pretty obvious. And this parable of the rich fool is the very wake-up call you might need. I'm trusting and praying that for some among us, this is going to be the year when you get serious, really serious about giving, when this becomes a core part of your Christian discipleship. And I'll tell you, if, if, if that happens, you're never going to look back. You'll, you'll take a special delight in participating in what God is doing. You'll never regret, never regret open-handed and generous giving to the Lord and to his work. It is only a blessing. It is never a loss in your life. If this is you, if this is your need and your time to make that real change, to learn that grace, to get serious about financial participation in the Lord's work, let me urge you, don't let the moment pass. Spend time with the Lord on this and pray over this. Let me encourage you. Let, let me encourage all of us as a church family. Let's buck the cultural trend in our place to store up wealth to hoard riches for our retirement fund. And let's instur, instead learn the grace of giving. Seek with the Spirit's help to be rich toward God. What's it going to mean for you to do that? What changes are going to be needed? What do you have to go home and pray through and work through, perhaps with your spouse and your family, to reset your heart and your financial agenda in the days that are to come? Let's pray together as we close. God, our Father, you've been so generous to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of the one who became poor at the cross, that we through his poverty might become rich in him. Make us, we pray, a generous people. Guard us from the folly of that rich man in the parable. Show us what it is to be rich toward you. And we pray that you would bless and multiply and use our resources for your gospel and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.